Thank you for everyone who has been very, very proactive and so engaged. And thank you for all your questions. I was just reading through and for all your greetings from 32 different countries. It seems to me really, uh, I'm so, so happy that you are all with us today. And thank you, Ben, for patiently waiting to start your hotly anticipated session. Um, if we can maybe kick off, Ben, are you ready? Absolutely, yeah. Hello, Alice. Hi, Ben. I am delighted to introduce my colleague, Ben Horton, Communications Manager at Chatham House. Ben, last week we had a centenary week and we celebrated all sorts of events throughout the week because the very first event happened in, in July 1920. One of our very special guests was the former UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and he was speaking to our director Robin Niblett and um, in the visual, in the Zoom room, we also had some young members uh, of the Common Future Conversation platforms who joined that panel. And the idea of linking the experience of experts such as Ban Ki-moon with young voices that are driving so much change today, that could be incredibly powerful, especially as the young are setting the agenda today. Yes. Um, well, yeah, thank you very much for that introduction, Alice. And uh, hello, everybody. It's been really uh, fantastic to watch the first session that, that just finished there on Africa. And it's great to see so many of you here for this first summer school. It's a, it's a very exciting experiment um, and we hope that you enjoy it. I'm looking forward to um, reading all of your feedback after the sessions as well. Um, yeah, as Alice mentioned, um, I'm one of the communications team at Chatham House um, and my job encompasses a whole range of a whole range of things really. Um, I do some digital marketing, I do um, some sort of conventional communications, media outreach, um, also help to coordinate some of our government relations activities um, and produce our podcast series, Undercurrents, which is the first plug of the day. I'm going to spend the next half an hour trying to get you to subscribe and read as many of our things as you possibly can. So yeah, Undercurrents, there you go. If you want a weekly podcast on current affairs. Um, but the kind of main part of my job, um, which relates just to what Alice was saying there, is, is trying to find ways to improve engagement between policymakers and politicians and younger audiences, younger people. And one of the main ways that we do that at Chatham House is through this project called Common Futures Conversations, which I'm going to tell you a bit about later. Um, but basically, it's an online platform which seeks to um, facilitate exchange between decision makers and young people based in Africa and Europe. Um, so judging from the uh, the location comments earlier, it looks like this applies to many of you, which is really exciting. Um, I'm just going to share my screen because I have some nice things to show. Yeah, I want to tell you a bit about um, how we approach youth engagement at Chatham House. But what I want to do first is I want to ask you to answer some more questions. Sorry, you're getting um, polls over polls in the last sort of 10 minutes, but we've got a few more questions for you. And really, I would like to hear from you what you think the kind of major political issues facing the world are at the moment. Um, so I've got five questions, which I'm we're going to have to be very quick to get through everything today. So I'll give you about 30 seconds for each question, if possible, just fingers on pulses. So what we've got here is we've got a list of big political issues facing the country, um, facing the world rather. Um, and what I'd like to do is I'd just like to know which of these issues listed are the most, which one is the most pertinent for your country? do you think this year? What's, what's the one that is really the most important? So give us a vote there. Okay, sorry, I didn't realize it looks like actually you can see all of the questions. So that's wonderful stuff. So just give me, give me your answers to all of these questions. So we're, we're thinking, firstly, what's the most important of those issues facing your country? What's the most important issue facing the world in 2020? Um, 
how do you feel about politics? Do you pay a lot of attention to politics? Do you not? I imagine, given you're here, that you pay a lot of attention to politics, but some may be more keen than others. And then do you feel that politicians in your country listen to people from your background, from your age group? Do you feel that you are, that you are heard in your country? And then we've got a final question at the end there, which is which of a list of channels, social media platforms and communications technologies, which of these do you see as a reliable source of information and news? And really you can pick as many as, as you want from that list. There's not, it's not a, uh, it's not a limited thing. I'm not asking you which one you think is best. I'm just asking you to think about if you see a post on Facebook um, from a news site or from a family member or a friend, do you see that as a reliable source of political information? We will continue. Thank you, everybody who voted there. This is going to be incredibly useful for me because these questions were all questions that we asked last year in a survey exercise that we ran um, which we promoted across Africa and Europe. We were trying to get the views of young people, which we defined at that time as under 35s. Um, but basically anyone sort of from your age upwards to 35. And we asked these questions alongside a range of other questions. And I just thought I would have a sort of, have a bit of a time here where we just worked out whether things had changed. And I imagine things have changed quite a lot. So I'm very interested to interrogate your answers later. But yes, yeah, so the Common Futures Conversations Youth Survey, we promoted in 10 languages last year, um, promoted it across Africa and Europe, and we engaged with over 4,000 people in 89 countries. Um, and from those responses, we created a data set of three and a half thousand responses within a specific age and country range. And we got rid of all of the explicit uh, sort of dodgy comments that some people, some people put in. It was quite remarkable to see what people decided to write on their surveys. <laughs> not recommended, not helpful. So here we go. So here is the answer to um, the first question that I asked you. This is what our three and a half thousand people said last year. And obviously you can see that that poverty, corruption, unemployment were very much up there in terms of issues that people were worried about on a country level. And health was nowhere to be seen, right down the bottom, how times have changed. <laughs> um, it is very interesting, actually, because it does feel like the conversations that we're having at the moment around health, around discrimination, um, and around technology, actually, are they're the, the sort of real hot topics, I would say, at the moment. Um, but this time last year, they were not on people's radar in the same way. Um, then we have a look again at what the most important issue facing the world is. And as you can see, climate change is just overwhelmingly huge compared to all of the other options, which I found personally very interesting because basically it wasn't an option that people selected when they were thinking on a country level. So I think in my own context, climate change probably isn't an issue. Um, but it is a big issue facing the world and it's kind of not up to my country to deal with it. It's up to everybody else. Um, so that's it. And again, we've got down there health, 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 health. It's amazing what surprises can sort of leap out. So then thinking about young people's kind of attention to politics, what we found was that people were incredibly politically engaged actually. So zero was, I don't pay any attention to politics. 10 was I think about politics all the time and as you can see up there we've got a lot of people around the 8 to 10 mark saying I really care about politics this matters to me a lot um, however people did not feel listened to remotely by the politicians in their countries so lovely kind of reverse reverse line there which is which is incredibly troubling um a bit depressing but perhaps unsurprising i guess um i don't know it'd be interesting to hear what you think in the in the q a box throughout this i i personally wasn't that surprised as someone who still defines himself as a young person i think that this was uh, this was pretty obvious in some ways but it was nice to be affirmed in that way and then thinking about the channels that we see as a reliable source of information and news i was kind of surprised by this in the sense that i thought it would be worse 
initially, I thought that most people wouldn't really trust any social media platforms. And actually, you can see there the big hitters, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, people do seem to have relatively high levels of trust, although it's not great, is it? We're never seeing really anything over 50%. Um, and yeah, and some of the more emerging platforms, I guess, Snapchat, Telegram, they're still very much kind of not seen as trustworthy. Um, so yeah, so we found that very interesting. I, afterwards, we'll share the results of, of your survey with you. I think we can do that, can't we, Alice, when we sort of collate all the polls together. So to move on, so this was very helpful for us in terms of understanding what sort of work we could do around youth engagement. Um, and what we established from the survey was that there was a clear sense of a disconnect between young people and politicians. Um, there was a lack of formal avenues for young people to engage with policy discussions. And also, as you could see through some of the issue comparisons, the issue rankings, there were misunderstandings maybe or, or differences between continents that we thought would be really interesting to unpick. And we'd seen that in several workshops that we'd run with young people over the course of the same year where we actually got them to sit down and talk about the issues in more depth. So what did we do at Chatham House about this? Well, in February, we launched um, an online platform, which is a closed community space, kind of like a forum, kind of like a social media site. In some ways, it's kind of hybrid thing um, where young people can come to discuss the major issues that were worrying them based on what we found in the survey. So we picked, we're basically focusing this year on climate change, inequalities and conflict and violence. Um, although obviously we've been talking a lot about coronavirus pandemic as well um, in recent months and what we're trying to get people to do if you can see the uh, the infographic on the right there is we're trying to get people to come up with local implementable solutions to specific problems um, so recently we were just talking about how can we improve youth representation in government um, and that was um, a particularly interesting one for us. And the idea basically is that to generate these ideas, the community then collaborates on refining those ideas. And then we set up events where the most popular ideas are pitched to policymakers who actually work in that space and who can actually, if they think the idea is good, could actually implement it. Um, so that's the kind of exchange that we're trying to facilitate through this. Um, we also have an open event series, um, which I can give you more details on. And there are all sorts of ways to engage on the platform through blogging, direct messaging, and these challenge idea challenges, are what we call them. So that's what Common Futures Conversations aims to do. Beyond the platform, as I said, we're, we're all about facilitating engagement with these policymakers trying to address this disconnect that we found in the survey um, and which I imagine you've replicated in your in your polling just there. Um, so we've managed to uh, set up interviews with major heads of state including the presidents of Côte d'Ivoire, Ghana, Malta. Um, we've also brought people together from our community to talk to policymakers from the United Nations, the African Union, European Parliament and many different NGOs um, and also national governments. And we've been collaborating with the Chatham House magazine, The World Today, on a special series looking at the impact of coronavirus from members of our community who are spread across the two continents. Um, and I should say at this point that we are always looking to grow this community. So there will be some caveats. At the moment, we are only sort of 18 plus. But for those of you who are aged over 18, please, um, check out how to join you can find out all the information on the comment on the uh, chatham house website and we'll send it around afterwards as well there's an application form um, so if this sounds like something that would be of interest to you then please do sign up um, and then i was thinking alice asked me just before we go to questions whether i had any advice for people who were looking to get more involved um, in the study of politics, but also just generally in engaging with politics. And I've got kind of four top tips. Obviously, join Common Futures Conversations is, a, is an obvious one. Yes, please. I would, I would be very, very happy to hear from anyone who is based in Africa or Europe and who is 18 plus. 
Um, and bear us in mind, we're going to be here for years, fingers crossed, if they don't cut all my money. So um, if you're 17 now, but you're going to be 18 soon, then please do sign up when, when the time is right. Um, but aside from Common Futures Conversations, obviously, if you want a career in, in think tanks or in policy generally, um, then it makes sense to be thinking about this from even a level ib kind of level what's what sort of subject should i be talking about studying and of course the big hitters political science economics international relations development studies those are all very well trodden paths into working at think tanks and you should definitely consider those if if they're of interest at university level but i would say more broadly think tanks are hiring um, a far more diverse array of people in terms of their educational background now. So I would say one of the best things you could do if you're still at school is to really double down on your languages learning. Like absolutely, if you, if you can speak one or more foreign languages, then you are very, very useful. <laughs> so that is a massive one. Um, also, uh, the humanities, history, philosophy, just gives you that kind of basic critical thinking, which can be so powerful. And it also gives you some context for the kind of debates that we're having now. I mean, the, the debate around Black Lives Matter, which is ongoing, has shown how important it is for modern day policymakers to have a really refined understanding of national histories and international histories. So that is something that I would definitely recommend you continue with. And also if you're more sort of scientifically minded, subjects like physics, maths, statistics can be so powerful. I mean, obviously the uh, survey exercise that we did at the beginning, I'm not, I, it's not my background. I'm not great at data, but the amount that you can do with basic data literacy is amazing. So I would definitely double down on those and don't think, oh, well, I didn't do political science or like government studies at school. So therefore think tanks are not for me. That's, that's couldn't be further from the truth. Um, act local is my other thing. It's something that we're trying to get the common futures conversations community to really mobilize around. You don't, I mean, with the exception of Greta and Malala, you're not going to change the world. At, at like when we're just sort of starting out like it's not you shouldn't be sort of down if you think I've not started a, a massive international campaign to change this particular thing always think about what you can be doing on a local level sometimes that is when the most achievable like outcomes can be found most satisfying you, you've got really to grips with your local community it's a small change even to go back to the Black Lives Matter example what if you went back into school when schools are finally open again after the lockdown and say um, to your English literature teachers, why am I not seeing more black authors on my reading lists? Why don't you even just think of it on that level? Um, and I think that that is something that maybe people lose sight of when they sort of say, we've got to change everything. We've got to change the world. Society has to make this fundamental shift. It only happens through kind of incremental local level change. And so thinking about whether you can get involved with your community centers, whether you can volunteer in different places, whether you could do charity work or whether you could even get involved in, in local government. I mean, I'm t speaking purely from my experience in the UK now, but increasingly town councils and county councils are thinking about how can they reach out to younger people and there is space for young people to be involved in local decision making. So I would definitely think about that. And then the final thing that I just think is so useful, really, if, if what you're saying is that you want a career in these sorts of, in this sort of sector, is you just have to be aware of what is happening. So keep up with current affairs it's so important and it, it adds so much to university applications it adds so much to job applications if you can say okay I, I i was reading this in the economist the other day i was i i read this chatham house expert comment which i found really interesting about this particular thing um i'm an avid listener of the chatham house undercurrents podcast just as a just as an example just a, a just uh, you know 
uh, and I really enjoyed their recent episode on this. Um, so I think just try and read really widely, find as many different sources of information as you can. Don't just get hooked on one publication. I think, you know, the Guardian newspaper is absolutely wonderful in the UK, but they present everything from a certain political perspective. It might be the perspective I agree with, but it's not going to help me understand society if I just focus on that. So make sure that you're reading widely, make sure that you're understanding the landscape that you're trying to get into. Um, and even just social media is such an easy way to do this. And in a sense, I would say the pandemic has been very interesting from that point of view, because all of us in think tanks, not just Chatham House, but at all think tanks have had to sort of say, well, what can we do when we can't have people physically come to our building for events anymore? And we're doing this. We, this, is, this is really triggered, as Alice was saying at the beginning, by, by the pandemic. And more and more think tank expertise, but also just generally political conversation is happening online now in events like this, which are open to you. So really try and make the most of that. And that there are far more open doors now than there were even, even two years ago, I would say. So study at local, keep up with the news and join Common Futures Conversations if you can, um, would be my ways to boost political engagement at this point. Um, if you want to stay in touch, if you've got any questions, career point of view, um, or just through you know, what is happening with Common Futures Conversations. You can follow us on social media. Um, you can email me if you have any particular queries about how to get involved with Common Futures or anything else Chatham House comms related. Um, oh, and by the way, I don't know if I mentioned it, but please listen to our podcast. Um, <laughs> it's called Undercurrents um, and it's available on all podcast apps. Now, I've kind of rushed through that presentation. I'm very sorry for that but I wanted to leave enough time just for some more of you to ask questions. Um, I'm really sorry that I don't have the expertise of the previous speakers. So if you didn't get an answer on an Africa question, then uh, I'm afraid I, I probably shouldn't be the person that answers that. Um, you're likely to know more about it than me. Um, but I'm happy to talk about youth engagement, Chatham House more broadly, career stuff. So anything at all. And um, yeah. Uh, Alice, should we, how should we Thank do this? You. Thank you, Ben. I think we have one hand in the air, Leah, Leah Varghese. Uh, would you like to ask your question, Leah? Yes, hello. Hi, hey. Leah. Hi. So how can someone detect bias in news media and be able to recognize when news outlets are using rhetoric to shape public opinion rather than providing reliable information? Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. That's a great question. Leah, maybe before Ben goes into it, tomorrow we are discussing a little bit about fake news and how to develop that critical thinking. And the director of our Asia Pacific program, who is leading on this session, asked if everyone in preparation for that session could watch the Trump's video where he announces that US uh, will severe all ties with WHO and she will also send a transcript before the event. So that will be covered, but then, yeah, please do go ahead. Yeah, sure. I mean, it, it's such a tricky one, isn't it, really? And I, I think that, as I was saying earlier, one of the most important things is to understand that no media outlet is truly impartial. It just doesn't exist. Every journalist and every media outlet has a way of approaching the world, a way of seeing the world that is going to color how they write about it. So I would say that, I mean, there are many strategies and I'm sure you'll go through them tomorrow, but I would say from my point of view, I try and get my news from multiple sources and I try and read how different outlets are writing about the same story. So comparing how Fox News, The Guardian and the BBC are covering the same story can give you a good sense of both probably what happened, hopefully what happened, but also how what happened is being interpreted by the key kind of political ideological sides. So I would say that that's kind of my, my big thing. Don't just 
read something go oh my goodness that was something that i didn't know um this is really shocking that's awful and just take it at face value if you see something that doesn't look right then go and check out another news outlet as well and if they back it up then maybe it's true but if they don't then at least you've kind of considered alternative alternative ways of thinking yeah um i hope that answers your question i'm sure you'll get a better answer tomorrow <laughs> Aiden, okay. would, you, would you like to, thank you, Leah. Aiden, would you like to ask your question and unmute, please? In relation to for people like me under 18 and so can't really engage in the future, uh, oh, sorry, current futures thing, what would you recommend that young people who are, international, who are interested in international relations focus on doing to kind of at least participate in some way? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, there are lots of different things that you can do uh, through Chatham House. Um, we are, Common Futures is just one sort of initiative that we have. Um, the Queen Elizabeth II Academy for Leadership, which Alice is also involved with, who she'll probably be able to share some more information on. They also have a, a schools outreach program. Um, there are also just all sorts of different ways to engage with our content as well. Our World Today magazine, um, which is our main kind of current affairs magazine, uh, which comes out six times a year, is currently freely available to school libraries. So one thing that you could do is get in touch with your librarian and make sure that you get online access to that magazine. Um, I think it is difficult. Um, Aidan, it sounds like you're in the UK, am I right? That is correct. Yeah. Um, cool. So I'm just trying to think about what I did when I was your age. Um, and I think that some really good alternative places to sort of get involved with this would be through um, organizations like the English Speaking Union. There's all sorts of debating workshops and debate training um, programs that can really improve your sort of engagement with these issues and also give you tools that are going to help you when you're at university, help you sort of how to speak in public, but also how to like construct arguments whilst also allowing you to engage with um, political issues that we're, that we're talking about today. And then also, I think, I mean, I don't know about your political persuasion, but all of the major political parties in the UK have youth movements. And I would definitely recommend thinking about sort of exploring those and sort of seeing whether or not um, they really speak to you. I, I, I think at your age, there's no implications of you, you know, if you join Young Labour or the Young Conservatives, that's not making a political declaration of your identity for life. Um, and I think that they can be a really, really good source of, of yeah, political engagement. Mm -hmm. Ben, do we have time for one more question? Yeah, sure. I can carry on. No worries. <laughs> Shall we ask Karina Maharani to unmute, please? Um, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Karina. Okay, so uh, one of my questions, uh, my question is, are there any advices for students living in countries where, you know, access to information such as international relations is heavily restricted by the government or at least limited? For example, news outlets spotlighting national events instead of uh, international problems. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, and yeah, thanks for the question, uh, Karina. And it's something that we've had to be considering for the Common Futures Conversations project, because obviously we're, we're trying to engage people across Africa and Europe um, and across a range of political uh, arrangements, I guess. Um, some of these countries are more hostile to free media uh, than others um, I think I'd, yeah I, I think I have to be quite careful because I don't want you I don't want to sort of be encouraging people to just go out and like get on VPNs and try and find as much sort of western media content because I mean like there's no guarantee that our media content is any better but also I don't want to get anyone in, in any trouble I don't really think that that's something that um, would be helpful for me to do not knowing the political context of of uh of like where you're coming from um i guess that what i would say is um 
that is why it's so important to pursue these th- things through educational establishments. So whether that's school or uni, they can provide a safe space for engaging with this that might not exist on social media um, or just sort of in the public realm. Um, and so I would say that if you're really interested in that, pursue that through your education um, because there are more likely to be safeguards. I, I think it's really tricky. I'm, I'm not really sure what to what to encourage in terms of in terms of sort of trying to access um information that may be sort of restricted yeah apologies alice i've got time for one more if you want okay shall we do one more i think uh, we have marianne next essentially what do you think of um sort of the way that politicians um age-wise tend like not to reflect the population's actual age so in terms of like politicians being too old and like you know the population being younger and like do you think that this can be changed or like you know should it be changed and things like that mm. yeah i mean that's a really interesting question I, I think it depends a lot on on the context so one of the interesting things um that we've been sort of tackling with common futures is exactly that kind of intergenerational dialogue which is such an important aspect of encouraging young people to get involved if they feel like there is a way to meaningfully engage with older people. Um, I think that what's, that's definitely an issue. Well, statistically from what I have read and speaking to our colleagues in the Africa program, um, it is a big issue in Africa. Um, In many of the countries in Africa, the age of the, of the kind of senior political leadership is way, way, way higher than the average age as going back to what Yusuf was presenting earlier with his kind of average ages of the, of the different countries. Um, Off the top of my head, I can't remember the statistics, but I think that it's something like the average age of the heads of state of all the African countries is something like 65 and the average age of the continent is in the twenties. And I think that that is a, that is a major problem because I think it's very hard for, for, older generations to really kind of be attuned to the concern of young people. So I think that there is a danger there if they don't properly put in kind of formats and channels through which you can have a kind of meaningful engagement. That said, there is definitely a role. um, There is definitely a benefit to experience in politics. And I don't think necessarily that in that context, just saying, well, the government must have an average age of 25 that's not going to necessarily mean that the government is better at serving the needs of those people. Um, and definitely from an administrative point of view, there is a big, um, a big benefit to be gleaned from sort of just professional experience. And I think that that's a really important thing. Um, in Europe, it's interesting because actually we have a, a slightly different problem. I would recommend um, reading the work of David Runciman on this, who is an academic at Cambridge, um, but who also runs the Talking Politics podcast. And he's very interesting on this because he points out that actually the problem in Europe is that young people really do feel unrepresented, but they are also demographically in a minority. So even like people talk all the time about is that I'm um, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Is that in the like current affairs section of the of his podcast? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, there's a uh, there's a lecture that he gave. It's in the Talking Politics feed on about all about demographics. Um, and he was saying that um, just so that I get this right, he was saying that basically on this question of voter apathy, you know, we're always told young people don't vote. If they voted, they'd get represented. Uh, that's why political parties protect people's pensions, but they don't protect student loans. Um, All of these sorts of questions around that. And he said, in Europe at least, it it would make no difference at all if you had 100% youth turnout at elections. They still wouldn't be a sizable enough chunk of the population to really encourage political leaders to to change what they were doing. Um, So it's not simply a question of voting. It's about finding new ways to engage and that's kind of what common futures conversations is trying to do is trying to say well obviously voting is important 
joining political parties is important and campaigning is important, but there are also these informal ways to make change. And I think that that's what we're trying to do at Chatham House, but it's also something that you're seeing a lot more frequently now, even this year um, with the Black Lives Matter stuff, but also the climate change debate, Extinction Rebellion, like joining these campaigns is another way to sort of pressure politicians to really take your views seriously. Um, and so I think that while experience is important, obviously we need to find ways to improve youth representation. And that's something that we're trying to do here, but it is a very complicated picture. And geographically, there are so many different stories to tell with it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank no you. Thank you, Mariam. Uh, well, we are definitely out of time, but I think when I'm, I'm just looking through all your questions and I'm sorry, we haven't been able to answer to every single person. There are about 70 in, in the inbox at the moment. This is definitely something that perhaps behind the screens, maybe we can employ more of our colleagues to perhaps go through the questions as they come in, just in case we don't manage to get to every single one. But thank you so much for being so active today and engaged. Uh, I was scribbling down my takeaway points and there are many to sort of take away from today's session. I mean, Chatham House's work on, on Africa, it's such a true platform for progress and uh, you know, playing such a vital role in, in informing policymaker and facilitating debate on African affairs. And then with, with Ben just now talking about youth engagement and giving some tips on you know, how to get in touch either with us through the platform or through the podcast, through the World Today, international affairs. There are so many ways that we can explore and I also saw many questions about you on careers at Chatham House and work experience and internships. We will get to that throughout the week and we have specific sessions which will just cover that. So don't worry about, we will get to those, those questions as well. But um, I would like to take this opportunity to thank you all for being with us today. And I'll see you tomorrow again at the same time. And until then, have a very good afternoon. Goodbye. <laughs>